Good afternoon and welcome to Brave Embrace. This is a warm place to gather to bring recognition to the bravery that is seen and found in the darkness of difficult moments. I want to inspire and encourage and boy today I'm feeling that way. I have the most special guest, a dear, dear friend, the wonderful, the one and only Christine McDonald. Welcome, Christine. Well, hey, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you have inspired Brave and so many people and you represent Brave for overcoming a, a series of life events that sent you down a path that uh, I know uh, was difficult to overcome, but you chose to do just that. You leaned in, you found your brave, and now you share that with everyone. So I'm excited you're here with us today and in Kansas City celebrating the opening of a remarkable place that's going to be a refuge and a haven for many survivors. Yes. Well, Christine, the first time I met you, you were on a stage in... Warnsburg, oh, Missouri, yes. sharing about <laughs> a story, yes, of reckoning. Do you mind talking a little bit about what has thrust you into the field of inspiring hope in people? Wow, gosh, that was so long ago, <laughs> right? I just, yes. I'm just like, my gosh, we've known each other that long, haven't we? <laughs> we have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, you know, I've, so I'm, you know, working in the anti-trafficking field. I, I guess I went through some things as a child. Um, I didn't know my father. And uh, so I grew up in a, like a fatherless home um, in foster care, um, sexual abuse. Um, uh, my mom just struggled with alcoholism, just really wasn't able to be present, you know, um, so there was a lot of stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, I uh, ended up on the streets as a vulnerable runaway after being in foster care and being sexually abused and dealing with emotional abuse and going to multiple, multiple schools and, uh, you know, just pure chaos, right? Just really darkness and chaos and instability. And, um, as a 15 year old runaway in an abandoned house in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the middle of the winter, thinking that my own individual survival skills were better than anything that um, I had faced, you know, throughout my journey. Um, I, uh, I, uh, five days in an abandoned house, alone, cold, and hungry. Um, like trying to figure out what do I do next? And I take off walking and this guy picks me up and, you know, he, uh, I remember when he rolled down his window and the, the heat from the car was so warm and I was so cold and he says, you need a lift? And I'm like, sure. And all I could think about was the warmth, you know, that I saw from the car, it was crazy. And he's like, when I was dirty, I'd been sleeping on the floor in this abandoned house for like five days. And he's like, hey, you know what? You want to come down to my place and, you know, we can wash your clothes. You can clean up. Are you hungry? And I'm starving. I hadn't eaten five days. I was starving. And um, he, uh, he grabbed me some food. And his place was actually a hotel room. <laughs> so he takes me to a hotel room. And I get in the shower. And I hadn't had a shower in five days. And I'm taking the shower, right? And, you know, I'm 15. I've got a lot of brokenness. I mean, I had been a cutter. I had dealt with alcoholism for my mother. And I had been told that, you know, how stupid I was. And that I was ugly. I was never in my mouth of anything. I sexually abused sometimes just in exchange for places for society. So just so broken and frail. And I come out of the shower wrapped up in towels thinking, oh my gosh, I just gave this man my clothes to go wash. And all I have are these towels to wrap up in. And I come out and the guy looks at me and then he looks me in the eye and he says, you are so beautiful. And I, I mean, it filled a hole in my soul, right? Those words filled a hole in my soul. I mean, don't we all have some kind of positive validation? And I just hadn't had that. And, it, it felt so good to hear somebody tell me that I was beautiful. I'd never heard that. Um, and um, he uh, 
asked if he could take some pictures of me because I was so beautiful and he wanted to capture that, right? And I'm 15. I never heard that, right? This guy just washed my clothes and fed me and I was hungry and I was cold and I was alone in an abandoned house. And so he was like taking care of those human needs. And um, he uh, took pictures of me and um, he didn't touch me or anything, but then he, he said, let me go get your clothes. And he goes and gets my clothes and I go in the bathroom to put on my clothes, right? And, and I come out of the bathroom and he's gone. He's just gone and there's money on the table. And um, he said, the room is yours, you know, for the rest of the night. Good luck on this little note. You know, so many needs met in that moment. Absolutely. And then left with so many questions. Right. About what did this mean? Right. And what is next? Yeah. Yeah. But be, feeling beautiful and feeling cared about was something that had been missing for you for a while, right? Absolutely. I mean, just food and, and shelter and wow, somebody telling you you're beautiful. Like I said, I had this hole in my soul. I had so much brokenness. And I took that money and I like walked back down to my abandoned house because we were just not far from it. I was like, I'm going to have to look for a job. And <laughs> the next thing that happened to me, I, it's just absolutely nuts, is this guy <laughs> pulls up beside me and he says, you need a lift? I said, oh, I'm just looking for work. And he says, you're in luck. I'm like, excuse me? He's like, so um, I have this company. I'm looking for help. I have, he hands me a help wanted ad. And he says, you see this thrifty nickel? <laughs> and he says, you see that ad right there? That's my company. I, I'm looking for work. He says, if you're looking for a job, you got yourself a job. Why don't you try it out for a couple of days? And if you don't like it, nothing lost. I'll put some money in your pocket you know, and drop you back right wherever you want to go. So what am I thinking? I'm thinking, oh, well, shoot, you know, because I'm 15. I just don't want to get caught because I don't want to go back to foster care. I don't want to go back to, you know, juvie, and I don't want to go home. So you're thinking this is the way out. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Right. right. <laughs> uh-huh. In my own 15-year-old, yes. very broken mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so he did have a company. His job was to sell flowers and bars. And so what he did was groom me. Um, he, he, he normalized this environment. So I go into these bars and I sell these flowers and I get cash every day. And I, at the end of the night, I give him all the cash and he gives me a place to stay. He doesn't touch me. There's beautiful clothes. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. There was food in the fridge. The home was beautiful. And, um, and then some time passed, um, a, a couple months passed, and he uh, he gave me a, a, a card. He says, open it up, open it up. And I open it up, and it had a picture ID in it <laughs> that had my picture, the fake name I gave him, which was Stacy Carr. Stacy, because Stacy was always the pretty, popular, smart. Everybody, like, had friends. I, never, I didn't have friends. I didn't know how to make friends. I was the kid that his clothes were usually dirty and mismatched and, you know, um, didn't fit in. We never stayed anywhere long enough for me to fit in. And, um, and I was 19. That made me a grown up. That made me an adult and I wasn't ever going to have to go home. Right. And I was thinking, I pulled the wool over his eyes. See, he thinks I'm Stacy Carr because that was the bogus name I gave Stacy because she was popular and pretty and Carr because he picked me up in a car. Right. And my 15 year old mind couldn't think of anything more genius. And it said I was 19. Look at that. And it just took us right into this place of what we now know is the grooming <sighs> and the leading into being trafficked. Yes, shortly after that, he, uh, took me to lunch and told me he was going to be gone for a while and introduced me to a gentleman as his brother and said that, you know, and this guy, he, he didn't touch me. He was never inappropriate. I didn't have a penny to my name, but I didn't care. He didn't ask me any questions. Didn't care. Um, it said I was Stacy Carr and I was 19 and I was like, Oh, I'm really fooling him. And, um, for $2,500, $2,500, he sold me to this man who he introduced to me as his brother, who actually owned several of these clubs that I was going in and out of selling these flowers. Um, 
and um, I uh, I left that luncheon that day, and he had to test the goods, and the goods were me. And the next morning, I was throwing some clothes and some concealer to cover the bruises from the rape, and was introduced to my new job where I was sold in and out of VIP rooms of uh, gentlemen's clubs in Oklahoma City, Coffeyville, Kansas, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Christine, my heart is just breaking as I'm hearing the story of, of this young girl who had all the dreams in front of her, but yet had met a difficult you know, existence and was just looking for help, was looking for things that are basic needs and through the manipulation of these human beings and those meant to harm, they had roped you in to this situation while kind of simultaneously somehow empowering you to think that this was okay and was better for you. And you found yourself being owned as a piece of property yep. for this man. Yep. My, my friend, what a story of, of brokenness. And, and I look at you now and I see this beautiful woman <laughs> and I think of the journey that must have come between then and now. So tell me a little bit more. So at 17, I was escorted off the property. I had no idea what town I was in at gunpoint. I was addicted by then. I had been raped more times than I couldn't even fathom. Paid for more times than I could even imagine. And um, beaten, you know, I wasn't even allowed to go to the bathroom on my own. And um, I was escorted off the property because basically, you know, in that life, I had two years of addiction and rape and beatings, you're used up. You're not bringing in the same amount of money. You're not, people aren't paying the same dollar in those back rooms anymore. And, um, I was told if I was ever seen again that they would kill me. And I had no reason to doubt that because I had seen girls walk away and never come back. And I didn't know what happened to them. And um, I'm walking down the street and I'm sure for real where I'm at. And the guy it's like, hey, you need a lift? And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, well, I'm heading to Iowa. So if you need a ride. And I'm thinking, uh, the potato state? And he says, sweetie, that's Idaho. I'm going to Iowa and I'm like well Iowa sounds a lot like Oklahoma and I'm just not so sure I'm him and I said so you go anywhere I mean what's in between here and there right and I'm just broken I've had so much trauma and emotionally and physical and and he's like well I'm Kansas City's the halfway point I'll be stopping there to gas up and eat. And I'm like, Kansas City? Oh, my goodness. That's like Chicago. <laughs> I was like, can I go there? <laughs> and he dropped me off in downtown Kansas City. And I spent the next 17 years being bought and sold in Kansas City, Missouri. Sometimes under pimp control, sometimes not. Sometimes online, sometimes on street corners. Oh, now, and there are so many myths out there about what this situation really is and mm -hmm. what it is made up of and what drives it and what and allows it to continue. Mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing just a couple of the myths that exist in, in the understanding of, of our world trying to get a grasp on this thing that is called trafficking? Well, number one, I think um, we think the women are out there by choice, but the crime itself is designed, um, you know, intentionally for the woman to be the one front and center or, or the man or the boy or the girl, because this happens to males too. Um, but it's designed for the object, if you will, which is the person that's being sold or paid for to be front and center. And so we just assume it's choice. Um, oftentimes the, the trafficker is, is in the background and maybe not even anywhere around, but I think the psychological prison, I think if you haven't experienced it, it's really hard to wrap your around that 
an invisible prison can be just as 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 chain binding as 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 a prison wall. Um, and so, and I think another one of the misconceptions again about the choice is um, the lack of options. If you don't know that there are other options, or or if you've tried other options and you're not accepted because of what has been done to you, you really don't have a choice. I mean, if you, so if you don't know that there's other options, it's, it's not an option. Exactly. And, and, and I think we always leave out that it's a demand driven crime. If there weren't buyers, traffickers wouldn't be um, procuring women. They wouldn't be exploiting our most vulnerable, recruiting our most vulnerable into this criminal activity if we didn't have a demand. And so we always leave out the demand and it's a demand-driven crime. And you talked about being in foster care, so mm -hmm. particularly vulnerable. Mm, yes. Broken spirit at home and then placed with those that you were supposed to be able to trust and, and find uh, you know, refuge and safety in. And is that something that's common? It is, it is. Um, <clears throat> actually, um, you know, I was in a, a foster care and then later on in a group home with a, with a young girl. Um, her name was Pam and she was murdered. Um, we were taught, you know, by one of the girls in one of the group homes how to survive and and we were taught how to hustle money um and um you know these girls are already in foster care so we're already like considered throwaway kids mm -hmm. unfortunately our society especially in america <laughs> we tend to think that things like being trafficked or exploited happen to kids like that you know what i'm saying and I, I think that's tragic in itself that our mindset as Americans that, yes. you know, haven't been involved in, you know, certain types of uh, challenges in their life would like say it's okay. Well, things like that just happen to people like that. People like it's, that. But it's really tragic to yes. Americans when it happens to somebody that comes from, oh, a two parent household, you know, a, a middle class or upper middle class family, right? That has opportunity, right? And, and privilege, if you will. Um, and um, it's tragic in our mindset when it happens to somebody like that. But I, we just seem to be like, okay, when it happens to somebody like myself or others that may not come from we don't see the same tragedy right it doesn't grasp us in the same well things like that just happen to kids like that right it's just and then it's like we accept it yes but it's every neighborhood every, every community, neighborhood every, city, every community especially every with city. social media mm -hmm. so social media has created a fair game everybody has a hole in their soul yes um now those holes can vary Right. And, and so a trafficker is going to, I mean, we throw up everything on social media and because of that, I mean, it's this platform and, and it's a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong, but if you have somebody, oh, my parents are fighting or, oh, you know, this is going on or, oh, that's going, a trafficker is just looking for something like that. Right. You see, they make posts about maybe they have low self-esteem or, you know, parents are nagging them about keeping their room clean. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah, sounds like every kid, maybe. every kid. Right. Especially and so now, maybe, uh -huh. even and with the now. pandemic yes. and everything going on where everything is just chaotic for everybody. Um, traffickers are just looking to fill that hole in their soul, but it's not intentional. They're intentionally lying and filling in the gap where they perceive as there would be a hole in their soul and right so so then if that hole in the soul is being filled even if it's phony or bogus right by an actor if you will presenting to pose whatever that hurt is and fill that lack of love or lack of attention or reassurance just whatever that is um you know that's inviting and then you start that conversation and 
And behind the computer screen, you can pose to be anybody you want to be. You can be a 56-year-old man who's posing as a 16-year-old who's going through the same stuff. I identify with what you're feeling. My parents do the same thing, right? And so you build that yes. conversation, which builds a relationship. Then you get to know more about them, which then Trust you have that much more to play on. Absolutely. It's all about manipulation. It's such a tragic situation to know that there are people out there facilitating that on purpose with the end goal of exploiting someone. And <sighs> The selling yourself. of people, pretty. Yes. It's one of just, it's, intentionally lying and deceiving just for the intent of selling another human being yeah that's pretty heinous yes so the abuses that you experience feed that feeling of lack of choice lack Mm -hmm. of option Mm -hmm. and then you talked about addiction as well Mm -hmm. and is that something that's used as a tool in addition to break down barriers or draw you to them i think that that could happen and sometimes the addiction so sometimes a trafficker will meet an addict and oh, feed the relationship, feed the relationship to that, that, right? Yeah, and, and in other cases like mine, the addiction became a coping mechanism for me. It became how I dealt with what had happened to me and how I did not have to feel what did happen to me. So it was kind of like... I knew what they were fixing to do to me. So I'd get high. And then afterwards I would get high to cope with the pain and the trauma. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have to feel what had been done to me. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it becomes that coping mechanism. Maladaptive, of course, but. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you found yourself in Kansas City. I did. 17 wow. years. Yes. Se- uh, 17 years. And you came to the city where you just dropped off on the street corner from this, this stranger that <laughs> I was dropped off in downtown Kansas oh, city by nice. in a park across the street from a couple of homeless shelters okay. and um, with 20 bucks in my pocket and a meal from captain D's. <laughs> so he bought me dinner and gave me 20 bucks and dropped me off. Good luck. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And it did not take, didn't take long for, you know, um, it wasn't safe. It was not safe for me to come and go as a female. I was young, right? Um, people, finally, guy was like, hey, I got you. Uh, you don't need to be down here. So he uh, cleaned me up, got me a couple changes of clothes, and uh, put me on the corner. And I learned what it was like to have a pimp. So in your mind, it felt like a rescue. For From a all the chaos down at the homeless shelters and sleeping in the park. And yeah, absolutely. Wow. So is there then a, a feeling of needing to almost pay back or appreciate or somehow it's just such a dynamic and complex uh, set of feelings and emotions. I'm, I'm sure that we're, we're being experienced. I, I think for me with that particular situation, it was fear. Yeah. I was scared of what he would do to me if I did it. Um, in the beginning, you know, he was really nice. Mm-hmm. That didn't last forever. And then it's like, what do you do? I'm in the city I'm here. I don't know anybody. Where am I going to go? And, you know, um, you know, yeah. if somebody decides, you know, so, you know, I, I read somewhere, I, I heard this at a conference I was at, and it says it takes about 72 hours through violence, um, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, and random acts of kindness to literally cause so much chaos in the brain that their ability to make rational decision-making process is totally thrown off kilter and so then control can start happening right because you can't think yourself through the process and and i already had a trauma brain i'd already experienced so much trauma so literally i'm on survival you you can only stay on survival mode so how do you survive you do what you're told because you don't know this person will kill you see you really explained that in a way that is easily understandable and yet also allows me to see that because of that state of the brain uh the common processes that we go through to problem solve or make decisions they're or any of that is totally just disrupted it's just gone it's disrupted disrupted and here you are faced with that where it's about survival mm-hmm. it's about living the next second to the next second and the longer you live in that state of mind which i had lived in it you know between 15 and 17 being bought right up still in that same 
uh, trauma brain, you know, survival mode, right? So those neural pathways are created in the brain. So you, you, there's no way of cognitively thinking through rational decision-making processes. And, and, you know, that's one of the important things that I always talk about when I do like human trafficking trainings for law enforcement, for human trafficking investigations is you've got to understand a trauma impacted brain and its inability to think through and make cognitive rational decisions. Um, and the longer they've been involved in that survival state, the longer it's going to take to A, bring them down and B, get them to be in a place to make rational cognitive decision processes. Wow, so you use that um, experience and, and the years of that to inform and inspire and encourage, uh, you know, kind of an army of, of those that want to go on the other side of it yes. and make impact and stopping it and supporting it. Yes. That is phenomenal. And I can't wait to hear about some of the things you've done. <laughs> but before we go there, do you think that type of brain and, and relational living happens after other types of abuses as well? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so let's, let's think about domestic violence. I mean, I think when we, I think that's probably the closest similarity when we think about some of those other types of abuses or relationships, if you will, mm-hmm. when we, that we could probably have a comparison to. However, one of the misconceptions um, about victims of trafficking is why don't they leave, especially when you see them by themselves? Why don't they just walk away? Um, you know, let's talk about domestic violence, which has been around a lot. At least it's been, <laughs> there's been activism and policies made for it longer than there has been for trafficking. And so what we know through the research with domestic violence is a domestic violence victim leaves on average seven times before they die in the situation and are killed by their abuser or leave forever. The average DV victim leaves seven times or dies in the situation. Hmm. Trafficking is so much more emotionally, psychologically, and physically abusive and manipulative. Why would we think a trafficking survivor, a victim of trafficking would leave any sooner. See, see, or when what appears to be a moment of freedom. um, But if I'm to understand correctly, do you feel in that situation like there are always eyes on you? Absolutely. And just because they look like they're by themselves, they know who's watching them and where they're at. Mm -hmm. If you're an outsider and don't know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And that's the same for the victim. The victim may not know that you have the resources to help them, right? But the victim knows who all is watching them and where they are. You're not going to know that if you're only seeing the victim. Mm. So is that type of fear you described, I'm also understanding that it is the the thought of the fear or the threat of what might happen. Absolutely. In addition to any physical violence or any kind of rapes or even the Uh withholding of food that you described and sleep. So deprivation of basic needs and necessities and then all those things combined. And perceived Mm -hmm. um, fear or perceived acts of violence, right? Mm -hmm. If if you've experienced violence, then the perceived threat of violence rehappening is still there. And they may have a child with their um, trafficker. And you don't know that because you're not going to see the child because the trafficker may have that child with them. And you're only seeing the individual working. You're not seeing, so you don't know all those other components, but that victim's going to know it. So when they're not wanting to engage with you or talk to you, you have no idea what that, that's why relationship and getting to know them is so important and taking your time and letting them lead that relationship so that um, they can trust you and so that they can share or they're willing to trust you enough to help them leave, even if they don't share the rest of the dynamics. I see. So if you're involved with the program or volunteering or wanting to make impact, you're talking about building that relationship of trust, but it takes time it does. for them to know that that is something they really can lean into without having to somehow trade anything or give anything, yes. but it's just truly theirs to have, right? That relationship yes. and that trust. Uh, did it take a while for you to find that kind of help? Uh, you talked about being in Kansas City for 17 years in the street. So there wasn't, there wasn't a place for somebody like me then. You know, 
social welfare people came calling and foster I, parents came looking. <laughs> nobody looked for me. Um, I had a number of um, encounters with law enforcement. They never mm -mm, backed. I mean, I had some pretty messy law enforcement encounters, like can't wait till I find your body so I could quit wasting my officer's time, my team's time, you know, dealing with people like you. Oh. You know, um, a lot of my friends were murdered. I mean, murders will target a prosecutor. It's the lowest of the totem pole when we think about crimes and, and, and social economic statuses. Nobody looks for a prostituted person and people that are looking to intend harm, you know, they know that. So they could go missing for days and days and days before maybe somebody, and who's going to look for them? The drug dealer, the pimp. I mean, they're not going to call the police. So, um, yeah, they're easy, easy prey. Um, and so um, I, there wasn't a place for, for me. I had tried to go to treatment once and I had so much trauma. They didn't know what to do with the trauma. Um, I get into treatment a few days into it. I start cutting because that's how I process my pain. Um, I learned in a lecture that um, when you do self-harm, cutting was, was my thing. Um, you know, um, you kick in the, the brainstem. And when you kick in the brainstem, the place in your brain that holds your trauma cannot work at the same capacity. So you literally, when you kick in the, the feeling, it's in, the sensation feeling by your, that was created through your brainstem, you can't have the same emotional elevation simultaneously. Oh. And, and it's funny you that learned I, this. I learned this at the New York school of medicine um, oh, when I was lecturing on, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was lecturing there and um, the, the lecturer prior to me was giving one about trauma in the brain and um, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, Oh, that makes so much sense. You don't yes. learn that in therapy. <laughs> Wow, it does. It helps us understand it. It helps up. you understand why you yes. do what you do. One time, um, I was I was trying my I hadn't eaten in days. I hadn't slept in days. I was just exhausted, and I had a couple of broken ribs from beatings from from my my guy, and uh, I I still hadn't made enough money, and I was sick, uh, so I had a cold. And I couldn't cough. I had broken ribs from him, and. Oh. I literally broke up a razor and started cutting so I could bleed everywhere. So somebody would call 911 so I could get away. So a razor, like one might use for mm -hmm. their legs or face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, could, I broke it down with my teeth and just started cutting. So there, cause so I just start bleeding everywhere. I, I wasn't trying to kill myself at that time. I had to get away from it. I knew somebody would see the blood. Maybe oh. somebody would call for help. Yeah, so really reaching out for help, mm -hmm. and there were were no services. There was I mean, nothing. Wow, I, I'm I'm just dying to know, like, how did you see hope in that moment? Oh, how did you dig down deep to see that? How did I leave? Is that yeah. kind of where we're going with this? Yeah. Yes. In the corner I worked, Independence Avenue in Spruce, down in the northeast corner of Kansas, Missouri. Mm -hmm. That was my primary corner. And um, there's three churches there. And, uh, you know, I hadn't had much experience with, like, God. I There was a little soup kitchen. You could go there and eat if you got there in time to get preached at. And you'd get told that, you know, you were prostitutes and addicts and that you were sinners and you were going to burn in hell. And you just get oh. told all these things. It's a rough message of faith to hear, isn't it? Right? And, but nobody give you solutions. Nobody tell you what to do different. Mm -hmm. um, but you needed to accept Jesus so you didn't burn in hell and turn from your evil, wicked ways. Well, believe it or not, we knew we were jacked up, but you didn't tell me the beautiful love story of Jesus that loved me enough to die for me. And I think sometimes if I would, I try to tell the love story of Jesus to every broken person I meet because think if I would have known somebody loved me enough to die for me that I meant that much to somebody that could have changed my heart yes. but I never heard that mm -hmm. and I just heard how awful I was right and but you had to do that before you could get sandwich and so I, I heard her this ugly messy and I had pastors that paid for me I had pastors that would pay for me oh. for sex and then I would see them an hour later drive by with their wife in the car on their way to preach a sermon I mean so I, I Right. How just because you say you're a Christian, I think sometimes Christians um, 
think when we say we're a Christian to somebody like a prostituted person or an addict or a homeless person, that automatically means you're bearing a white flag. But if I've been paid for by pastors and I've only been told how awful like, disgusting I was because I was a prostitute by church people, that doesn't mean you're carrying a white flag to me. You know, on my end, excused or yeah, 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 allowed to to make this behavior. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. and I and so uh, (laughs) I uh, I used to the corner I worked had a a little church, and I used to like, if there is a God, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. I saw my friends. I never saw them leave and come back. I saw people be murdered mm. and never come back but I never saw somebody like leave and make it and then come back I never saw that they ended up in prison or they ended up dead and nobody cared so I believe that death was the only option for people like us that is the only freedom we could get I tried to go to treatment and I couldn't do it. In fact, I had a, one time I went to treatment, I had a substance abuse counselor make a pass at me and all I could feel like, well, I guess my body is all that I'm worth. I hear I am trying to get help and he's making a pass at me. What do you do with that? Yes. And um, if there is a God and he's merciful, whatever that meant, that you know, death would find me. And I needed it to find me quicker than later because I, I remember one time going down, I had been locked up. Somebody gave me this card and said, if you go to this address, these people, these people help people with criminal backgrounds. They help, they'll give you a caseworker and they'll help you, you know, get a job and stuff. And I wait two weeks for my appointment <laughs> and I show up and she says, we are not going to give you a caseworker. You've been on the streets too long. You've been arrested too many times. You've been involved in prostitution too much. And if we were to exhaust our resources to help you, we wouldn't be able to help other people that don't have so many barriers. So you were here and you weren't worth helping? I was here. There was no room right. for you to be helped? Right. And so I went back in the streets. There's no place to go. I was like, well, sure. I waited two weeks thinking that... <laughs> And you're going to tell me somebody else is worth help and I'm not because what they have more supports or they have less challenges. I mean, how does that even make sense that the people the most in need get the least amount of help? So, I mean, I tried several times, right? I, I share those stories. Julie. I, I tried a couple of times to leave and get out when I had opportunities and I couldn't find the help I needed. So I, I prayed, I prayed if, to this God that I didn't know or understand let death find me because I can't, I can't handle this. I can't be raped one more time. I can't be beaten one more time. I don't want to be paid for anymore. And I don't want to have to sell my body just to eat. And a little red truck, broad daylight, turn a corner and smile at me, flashes break light. I walked to the end of the block and I got in. We drove over to Truce by the railroad tracks and he got out of the truck and he come around to my side of the car. And he pulled me out and threw me to the ground and he beat me like I had never been beaten and I had been beaten a lot. And um, he raped me for hours. And I remember nodding in and out of consciousness and I realized he's done so I'm trying, I'm trying to open my eyes and I'm trying to focus on, you know, what's going on present in the moment, right? My ears are ringing and my, I've got blood on my face and he pulls me up to my knees by my ponytail and he takes a gun and he holds it to my head and he tells me to give him a reason to let me live. And I close my eyes and I said, there is a God. I thought it was finally over. I didn't understand the psychology then that I do now. People like him thrive on fear. I wasn't scared. I was 
ready. And I waited. And um, he got angry as he continued to tell me how despicable I was and spit on me and uh, just screaming at me to give him a reason to let me live because I was so vile. And um, I just waited for him to pull the trigger. And he didn't. And I realized he was fixing to rape me all over again. And he was fixing the same thing all over again. And all the years, I learned a lesson early on in life. If you don't fight back, <laughs> it won't hurt as bad and it won't last as long. Mm -hmm. You just curl up and surrender, right? Until it's over. And um, I was so so mad that God didn't let me die in that moment and that I was left here to do this over again and I was angry for every one of my friends that had been murdered I was angry for every vile thing that had happened to me I had so much rage in me and um I had a chance to get the gun and I did and for the first time I had the power in all those years, I never, and um, I pointed the gun at him. I looked him in the eye. I said, get on your knees. And I remember the fear I saw in him, in his eyes and his face. And I thought, nobody ever, never saw mine, ever. I don't even know this guy. I hate this man. And yet I see his fear. And I told him to get on his knees. And he did. And he sobbed. He told me about his wife and his kids, his job. And he begged for his life for your grace in that moment. And uh, God gave me the strength to not murder that man because that was my intent when I pulled that trigger. You pulled the trigger. I did. I emptied that gun in the ground and God's protected me from killing him because if, if I would have murdered him right there that day, I wouldn't be here today. I threw the gun as hard as I could. I gathered my clothes, I wiped the blood from my face, and I never went back because I knew I had the capacity to kill. I knew that once that was unleashed, there'd be no going back. And I didn't want to be a monster. And um, I got arrested um, just very, very shortly after that on a parole violation. And um, never went back. Never went back. I knew I couldn't. So that was my exit. And nobody would help me. There was no nowhere for me to go. Um, I got hired at a job at McDonald's. <laughs> um, I knew my ABCs. I knew my one, two, threes. But I was basically illiterate. I knew how to write my name. But basically illiterate. And um, God told me, he says, you know, with that smile's early, you got yourself a job. But I'm only going to pay you the same thing I pay high school students because you don't have a GED. And quite frankly, you're not young and you've never had a job in your entire life, which was true. I'd never had a job. I'd never had a job. And I was in my 30s. Um, and um, I didn't know how to be an employee. I, I didn't know how to function in society. I'd never had a home. I didn't know how to manage that. It, it, I attempted suicide. Um, because of the adversities. I didn't know. That you faced upon and I didn't know how to express, mm -hmm. you know, what I was experiencing and how everywhere I went, I just, I mean, thousands of men had paid for me. So 
I'm not using, I'm working at McDonald's and I'm thinking that every man that comes through is probably a man that's paid for me. I mean, how do you even, it was, I don't even know how to articulate the, the craziness that it was to try to figure out how to be normal when you felt so unnormal and so separated from the rest of the people around you. I mean, it was crazy. But Christina, just a few short years later, <laughs> you write a beautiful love I story. I did. You write, <laughs> write her poem. I did. I did. And you not only share about this journey, but you talk about the transformational moments where you were able to turn that pain <laughs> into bravery and yeah. into hope. Yeah. I, yeah. I read about how those experiences with law enforcement and those that weren't oh willing to help just fueled you to yeah. turn that system to turn to training oh my gosh to turn yes. to education to turn mm-hmm. to speaking yeah I mean I think once what I realized when I wrote cry purple what I realized was so many people didn't understand the complexities that keep people bound in the light and the vulnerabilities that lead people into the light and I just knew once people understood a broader dynamic of it, they, they'd have to have to want to do something. Um, and so I started with snapshots of Cry Purple. Actually, Cry Purple was actually written. This is funny. Um, Cry Purple was written. I had gotten a job since I got my GD and I went to college mm-hmm. and I got an internship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my internship, I got hired and I was working at this place for, for several years and they closed down. And when they closed down, I was left without a job. And, you know, I'm now blind and I have this criminal history from my previous past, but I'm several years out of my life, out of the, out of the life, you know, on this new journey. So I'm thinking, oh, well, I've got this work history. Somebody's going to hire me. Nobody would hire me. And I was running out of unemployment. Nobody would hire me because of my criminal past. And the caveat of being blind is like, I don't know the people, it's like, if they didn't, couldn't hire me because of the felony. They didn't know what to do with me because of the blindness. <laughs> it was crazy. So I was in this, right? I was in this really weird place, right? And um, I was like, well, I have a couple hundred friends on Facebook. And I'd already been doing advocacy. I'd already been speaking. I, a lot of my focus was on, you know, reentry and gender-specific monitoring because women's needs are unique. And, and, and advocating against the criminalization of the homeless. Um, and because um, I was still in a lot of therapy because of my trauma and from, you know, rapes and, you know, just so many things, that violent things that happened to me in my trafficking experience. And so uh, I thought, well, if I got a couple hundred friends, maybe if I finish up this book, <laughs> if I got a few of my friends to buy it, I could get enough, make, you know, 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there, selling books. And at least keep me and my kid in stable housing. Mm-hmm. And um, who knew that, you know, people would actually buy it and read it. <laughs> so I tell everybody I'm an accidental author because I did not think people would buy it and read it. But people not only bought it and read it, prisons started buying it. Treatment yes. centers started buying it and using it in their treatment centers to work with women. Drug courts started yes. buying it, referring to women um, who had experienced prostitution and exploitation to read it. And their family members to read it to understand some of some of some of those deeper complexities and then I'm like well shoot let me go back and write what I really wanted to say <laughs> and that's when the second book that's came when the out. second book came out uh, girl from being you know what you called uh illiterate or not able to, to write and to just having that beautiful smile the compelling way in which you share not only with us today but in these books so talk, talk about same kind of, of human. oh my gosh mm-hmm. so same kind of human um, it's my favorite. <laughs> you love it. This one I have read. I tell you, girl, <laughs> dog ear pages. I underline, <laughs> I write. Because what you share touches the place in each of us that allows us to know that the hurts and the heartaches are worth pushing through they and are. And that there's glory on the other oh side. Oh my gosh. Okay. And that, yes. Yes. And I think one of the things with Same Kind of Human, okay, so Same Kind of Human was written like, what, 10 years after I wrote Cry Purple. So, um, same kind of human really, I, I was really intended to, number one, help draw out people's bias and judgments from understanding people being homeless, people 
being addicted, people with mental illness, people being exploited. Um, and I wanted to use commentary. I wanted to use scripture. How does Jesus call us to reach out to the lost? And, and so I, I set the stage with guided commentary and scripture. Um, I was assisted by an amazing friend just because, you know, I didn't want to be too mean to people. <laughs> um, so to help it tone it down and things. keep it, yes. yes. Um, and then I use narratives. And then at the end of every chapter, there's a series of questions. Who do you identify? Why? Right? What bud judgments or biases did you identify in your own heart, right, that kept you from you know, connecting to uh, the individual in the story or the story situation, because some of the stories are also of my friends. Um, and then the second half um, is, um, so it's written for churches to work through, like in life groups or in, in conference settings or Bible studies or, 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 or organizations. And then the second half, the last 136 pages is actually Tools that I've used and learned, not only from school and education, but actually doing real hands-on work with girls um, in, in, in leaving lives of exploitation that have worked. Because yes. there's a whole lot of stuff out there written, but some of that, once you do it in real life application, eh, not so great. Right. And, and so some things work better than others. And so I have some really great, these things really work. I mean, I encourage everybody themselves that reads the book to go through the ad first childhood experience Just testing so they can see share. their own own numbers part. because mm -hmm. once you identify where you're at in your own mess mm -hmm. and then you think about somebody that's been through so many more it's a lot easier for your heart to be more understanding of, of the trauma brain and mm -hmm. and people's decision making process or lack of ability for a decision making process well, and the, the challenges that came with, with the blindness, um, which was just <laughs> shortly after, you know, changing your life and transforming and through childbirth, uh, yes. there were some, some issues and complications. Um, yes. So it brought on what now though, I think has been this beautiful piece of you <laughs> where people, um, you can relate and bond to people through all of the feelings and the emotions of, of that you're given. I think, you know, so... The, the whole blind thing, you know, losing my sight while I was pregnant, having a choice of medication to save my eyesight or the life of my unborn child. And I chose my child. And then after the birth, I had to have both my eyes medically removed. I think that was probably a blessing. And, and I, I say that because, because of so much violence. I mean, I've been held at gunpoint to dig my own shallow grave. I've been bringing up with a cattle iron. I mean, I've just been through so many, so many things. And my ability to trust people or to be interdependent of people around me, it, it just hadn't happened yet. And, um, when I became blind in three days, <laughs> I had to trust random people to, just to get me to the bathroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I, I think that became that tool, A, to grow my faith and B, to help me learn how to be interdependent of people around me. So it removed some of those trust barriers that I had that I probably wouldn't have gotten through so quickly um, because of my past. And so it became something that really catapulted me into my faith and my growth um, and interdependence with my fellow man. Um, and um, I, you know, I struggle with the blindness because I, <laughs> my eyes being removed, it's like pitch, pitch black. It's pitch black. It's like dark, like no darkness I've ever seen. And all the years I was on the street, I've always scared of the dark because bad things happen in the dark. You know, and, and, and it grew my faith even more with God because every day I have to trust God to give me the strength to face the fear of the dark that I walk in every day when I open my eyes. So, um, yeah, God and I, we got a pretty cool relationship. <laughs> well, I would say, because I recently learned about all of the amazing projects that are going on for you right now. Oh my gosh, yes. And it's clear that God truly has <laughs> never not only left your side, oh, but already had visioned all of this yep. for you. Yeah. Even in taking your sight, yes. there was something that was about to happen for you. 
there's someone knocking on the door yes, there is. the studio and I apologize uh, <laughs> but I want to hear a little bit about Christine's place that is open. oh my gosh we have about five minutes left okay okay so please tell me about that okay so um you know one of the things is even a sandwich out on the streets costs technically a blowjob like you even food comes at a cost right I mean just depending on your pimp or whatever it comes at a cost it, nothing's free and um you know, we used to dream, I mean, was anybody going to care about people like us? I mean, thousands of cars would pass us every day. It's like we were invisible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in 2007, which I've been out a couple of years, I've been out three years then, I started doing street outreach. So I'm a blind lady driving around trying to find people with sandwiches, you know, with training drivers to drive me around. And, mm -hmm. you know, through the, through the years, you know, I continued to do that. And then, um, you know, I've, I've done several things in working in long-term transitional living homes and things like that. And then recently, uh, <laughs> this amazing group of people, Relentless Pursuit, um, reached out to me and said, hey, <laughs> we're working on this project. I'm like, okay. And they shared with me their vision of what they want to do. I was like, that's my vision. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and um, they says, well, we plan on naming it after you. So it kind of be important for you to be a part of it. I'm like, excuse me. To me it's like yeah we done read your books and oh. I'm like what it's like yeah so so um relentless pursuit um is the not-for-profit um that started and funded christine's place um hence me christine yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. pursuit and Love these folks uh-huh and it's Love in partnership missions. it's in partnership with the e3 foundation um and you go right in and <laughs> um it's in partnership with the e3 foundation and so we all are like work together yeah. um and we're a drop-in center on independence avenue the very street where i was bought and sold for 17 years oh. the girls can come in off the streets and they can get a sandwich and they can walk right back out the door um or they can come in and get a sandwich and choose to stay and we'll help them find services um it's it's an amazing thing um relentless pursuit is also working to um address the demands as i shared earlier in the show um dem trafficking is is a demand driven crime if we didn't have buyers um we wouldn't have traffickers exploiting our vulnerable um and then of course um we uh, also plan on having a sanctuary for the exploited, um, which is where the girls will be able to come. Law enforcement will be able to bring them when, you know, they do a sting at two o'clock in the morning or they find a victim. And, and there's nowhere to take them right now. They take them to jail or they just let them off. And so they won't have to do that anymore. The idea of having a place right where my exploitation happened is just, I don't know. It's, it's just... Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and um, no judgment zone. You come in and you can walk back out or you come in and you can stay. And I know it's going to take a while to build relationship with some of those girls. And it's not easy to leave because fear is a powerful thing. Um, you know, but right there, right there right. on Independence Avenue, yeah. right, right there. Same. The very place, the very place that brokenness occurred. Huh? That there's going to be so much poor <laughs> people. Oh my lives gosh, changed in a place for our partners now that you're partnered with law enforcement. And oh my gosh, yes. advocacy agencies. Yes, and the models rep replicatable. That was one of the things that you know we agreed on. Me, you know, over at the the drop in center, and and Lee and the great group with Relentless yes. Pursuit, we all agreed what we do here has to be replicatable anywhere and so um we're, we're looking forward to um the, this model being replicated. and we didn't reinvent the wheel we just pulled together multiple things that were already happening that we knew weren't into one place christine i am just in awe and i've loved our conversation oh me too oh my I gosh there's a time that you'll come back and share with us as your mission continues to grow I love what you're doing. I love the story of your uh, bravery, but I love your heart. Aww, uh, thank you. You have changed so many lives, <laughs> mine included, across this world. And I hope that those that are interested will learn more about Christine on her website, buy her book, read her story, understand 
what this crime is about and how lives can be changed. Yes. Because truly these compelling stories of courage are found in the darkness of difficult moments. But we're in this together. We are. Yes. I think when we think about trafficking and exploitation, it sounds huge and massive. Um, one of the quotes I'm known for is, if we do for one, what we wish we could do for many, together united, we can change our, our community, our city, our nation, and eventually the world. So we just do for yeah, one. Do for one. It's really, satisfying. that's simple. Yeah. The takeaway from this is that the impact is real. It is. And I really thank everyone for joining us today. I think Christine and the teams on the ground <laughs> and the dedication of new artwork in a park some amazing things that we'll continue to bring and you can find links to all of these things on our website at the miller law on facebook christine thank you again for joining us thank you and uh i appreciate you so much my dear here's to many more wonderful conversations with you bye-bye